Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Philip James and joined by today's guest, Dr. David Schneider. And depending where you are in the world, where you're viewing this live episode, uh, either good evening, good afternoon, or in some cases, it might be good morning. But for those of you in the U.S. or uh, in that part of the world, uh, good evening. And uh, Dr. Schneider, welcome. Nice to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And this is a shorter uh, a video. So for those of you attending, please feel free to ask questions and they'll be displayed on the screen as we are talking to Dr. Schneider. And if we do not have time to address them directly during this live video stream, Dr. Schneider is logged into uh, Facebook and he will respond to any of your questions uh, immediately following the interview. And also I'd like to mention that if you're listening to this, uh, because this will be shared as a, a podcast, you can always watch the video either on YouTube or Facebook. And then opposite, if you're watching this live on Facebook or YouTube, then if you'd like to listen to it, say on your drive to work, you can always find it on the Dr. Thyroid uh, podcast on iTunes. So Dr. Schneider, um, you know, when we talked, you said, uh, as far as a topic, you said there's a difference between thyroid disease and parathyroid disease, and you're really passionate about parathyroid disease. How, tell us the evolution, how you became passionate about parathyroid disease. Yeah, great question. Um, I think what I noticed was that um, parathyroid disease has a lot of symptoms that can easily be attributed to other things. Um, so it could be attributed to aging or arthritis. Um, and parathyroid disease is often underdiagnosed. And so what I experienced was patients that have been suffering from this for many, many years, sometimes five, 10 years, or even longer. And then when we fix the parathyroid problem, they feel dramatically better and better very quickly. And so that just was really satisfying for me um, as a physician. But then also because I know how vastly underdiagnosed it is, I see that people are suffering for a long period of time. And so I think I'm passionate about it because I also want to raise awareness about it so that people can get the treatment sooner and you know reduce the time that they've been suffering. How common is it? Well, that's a good question. You know, the textbooks would say it's, you know, about 1% of the population. But a lot of research has been done um, looking at large populations of patients. So, you know, data from big health systems like Kaiser or Cleveland Clinic um, and other studies where they're able to look at large swaths of the population. And we see from the laboratory uh, results there that it's probably a lot more common than what is reported because people don't recognize it. And so, you know, I would estimate that it's probably closer to 5% or even higher of the population, which is a pretty decent amount of people that probably are suffering from this and don't even know they have it. What are the symptoms of parathyroid disease? Yeah, and that's, um, you know, one of the areas where there is overlap with thyroid uh, problems. So, um, the classic symptoms are aches and pains, um, especially bone pain, like in the long bones of the legs. Um, um, but it could be joint pain and, and, you know, pain and cramps anywhere in the body. Um, fatigue is very common. Um, um, trouble sleeping, um, thirsty all the time, having to go to the bathroom a lot, um, um, headaches, abdominal pain, constipation. Um, and then there's a whole host of what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms. So feeling like your mind's in a fog, having trouble with memory and concentration. Um, some people describe the disease as premature aging. Um, and so that's a good way that I like to think about it is that there's this whole host of somewhat nonspecific symptoms um, but, you know, it, it and, and that's one of the reasons why 
um, doctors and patients don't recognize they have this because they just say, oh, well, I have these symptoms, but it's just I'm getting older or they attribute it to arthritis or other things that could be going on. So so a lot of symptoms um, and a lot of ones that very well could be due to other things. But, you know, that's one of the reasons why this is so underdiagnosed. What you describe as the symptoms seem to be overlap uh, with a lot of listeners of the Dr. Thyroid podcast at Thyroid Cancer. And what you're describing is, one, what thyroid cancer patients complain about a lot in symptoms yeah. post-thyroidectomy, and also yeah. what patients who have hypothyroidism complain about. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, especially the fatigue, um, you know, often weight gain is a problem that goes along with parathyroid disease, because if people aren't feeling well, then they're not as active and they tend to gain weight. Um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of the symptoms go along with hypothyroidism or, or you know, being in a post-thyroidectomy state. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where I, I've met a lot of patients that say, well, they checked my thyroid numbers and everything was okay and I, I still just don't feel right. I would say that well, look into the parathyroids then too to make sure that that's not a cause for how you're feeling. Um, is there a certain profile, a patient that you are finding suffers from parathyroid disease? Yeah, great question. I would say most commonly it's, you know, people in their 50s and 60s and mm -hmm. predominant, like a lot of, you know, like thyroid disease, it's predominantly more women than men. Now that said, um, I hesitate to even say that because you know I've treated patients in their you know children and teenagers all the way up to people in their 80s and 90s. So you know I think it can affect anyone, but the most common is probably you know women in their 50s and 60s is the most common profile. Um, so the treatment. Yeah, the, so um, you mentioned how do we diagnose it. The, the good news is, is that it's really, the diagnosis is based on laboratory tests, so blood tests. And the main things are measuring the calcium levels and the parathyroid hormone levels or PTH levels. And so um, the calcium is often high and the PTH is often high in this disease. Now that said, there's a form of it or two forms of it where either or both numbers could be in the normal range. So you really have to look at the relationship between those two numbers. Um, the treatment, so the problem is that the parathyroid gland or glands, so there's four of them. Um, so one or more of them is overactive and the treatment is to remove the overactive ones. When they're overactive, they get bigger than the others. So that's what I see as the surgeon is um, a normal one is about the size of a grain of rice. And mm -hmm. so anything bigger than that is abnormal. So there's four. You're saying if there's a couple that are overactive, you might remove those. Yep. Um, is there a danger to removing? Yeah, that's a great question. So you only have four of them. So we can't remove all four of them because then you'd have the opposite problem, meaning calcium's too low. So they are important to keep in your, mm -hmm. your blood calcium, you know, up in the normal range. Um, and so even if all four are involved, the most that we would remove is either three or three and a half um, to prevent you from having hypoparathyroidism, which results in, you know, chronically low calcium, which is actually a, a very difficult problem to, to treat and take care of. And so you really want to have this surgery done by somebody who's really experienced in thyroid and parathyroid surgery and knows what exactly what they look like, how to protect them and, and prevent, uh, you know, from damaging all four of them or, and you definitely don't want to remove all four of them. What are the symptoms of, for example, with thyroid cancer patients when they had their parathyroids damaged and which was the case when I received a thyroidectomy, uh, the parathyroids were damaged and okay. but what are the symptoms? Yeah. So the symptoms of, uh, parathyroids that aren't working well enough or not at all are result in low calcium. And the symptoms of that are um, numbness and tingling, 
Um, and that's usually around the mouth and face or in the hands and fingertips, but could also be, um, you know, in the legs and feet as well. Some people feel it in different ways. So some people feel it more as cramps um, and some people have other um, kinds of um, neurologic uh, symptoms from it. Um, but predominantly it's numbness and tingling, which you could imagine that having that kind of long term is 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 really annoying and so mm -hmm. we do everything we can to try and prevent that with either thyroid or parathyroid surgery okay so um yeah so so the treatment of parathyroid disease um what happens next so the 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 way to treat it once and for all is to remove the overactive gland or glands okay. and that means a small surgery um, you know i do it usually as an outpatient um, and we're able to do it through a little mini incision maybe about an inch or so um, and um, as part of the treatment we want to um, decide whether it's just one gland which is the most common scenario um, but 20 percent of people have more than one gland and so all of our all of the surgery and the the design of that is set up to do the right amount of surgery to fix the problem but not do more than the patient needs because then you risk what we were just talking about before which would be hypoparathyroidism mm -hmm. or damage to all four of them how are you is it an ultrasound how are you seeing the size in the parathyroids before surgery yeah, good question. So I predominantly use ultrasound because it's uh, easy. I can do it right in the office. There's no radiation exposure with it. Um, and if you fall into that category where it's just one big one, I can often see that one big one on an ultrasound. If, um, if I don't see it, it could mean one of two things. Either one, it's in a location that isn't able to be you know, viewed well by ultrasound. Um, and then there's some other um, imaging techniques that we can use. Um, or it means that you fall into the other category where you know there's more than one. And for whatever reason, in those patients, we often don't see anything on the imaging because most of the imaging tests are designed to pick up that one big one and not necessarily show all of them. And I think that's mainly because when all of them are big, they're not quite as large as the scenario where it's just one big one. How does a patient who is suffering from parathyroid disease land in your office? I mean, sometimes they've probably been suffering for years and it hasn't been identified. So yeah, how do they end up sitting with you? So I would say um, one of two, well, really three ways. Um, ideally, their physician, you know, their primary care doctor would notice that their calcium is high on their blood work. Calcium is part of a panel that is often checked on patients, you know, like say with their annual physical and things like that. Um, but as we were talking about at the beginning, unfortunately, that's, that's, you know, that's where the problem lies and that often, you know, physicians don't recognize it. The second way is, you know, if they have bone disease and are referred to a specialist, either an endocrinologist or someone that specializes in bone disease, they will um, often uh, be prompted to check the parathyroids as in part mm -hmm. of making sure that that's not a reason for the bone disease. Because um, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the consequences of having the parathyroid being overactive is that it's stealing the calcium out of the bones in order to put more into mm -hmm. the blood. When there's high calcium in the blood, um, then that ends up in the urine. So another symptom that could mm -hmm. result would be kidney stones. And so that's another reason to have this looked into. Um, and, and so then there are a bunch of patients that refer themselves because of the scenario that I was talking about where they feel lousy, they have all the symptoms, they're able to find information you know, online or maybe our website or another group's website and they realize, and they look at their blood work and they say, huh, my calcium has been high. I think this is a parathyroid problem. I wish it. I wish more physicians would would refer and recognize it, but um, but the reality is is that that's often how it's discovered. 
how is it most often wrongly treated? Um, how often does a patient suffer from these symptoms and a doctor thinks, oh, it must be hypothyroidism. Here's some uh, yeah. thyroid replacement hormone, go home. And they, even though they have a high calcium level, maybe it's overlooked and the doctor's just thinking what you're describing is hypothyroidism. You know, or, yeah. so how is it most often treated incorrectly? Um, good question. I would say, I would say it's most often just not recognized, even in the patients that where their physician does eventually recognize it and refer it to me. If I look back through their chart, you know, their electronic medical records, mm -hmm. I often see that this has been going on for years and years and years. In fact, it's not uncommon mm -hmm. for me to look back and see that this has been going on for you know, five, 10 years or even longer. And so um, I would say the most common way, the, the most common error is just under recognition. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens is there, there is a particular medication um, mm. that lower, that can lower the calcium and the parathyroid levels. Um, however, it's not doing anything to correct the bone loss or doing anything to definitively solve the problem once and for all. That medicine is really only indicated for a specific type of patients that have renal failure. And so, um, and so I guess that's the another common error that we see is just using that medicine incorrectly. Once treated correctly, tell us like two or three wonderful stories that you know, almost life changing after you identified it and, and treated the patient correctly, if they have been suffering for years and they finally come to you and you're able to identify the real problem, the real issue. Uh, can you share with us yeah. kind of these almost life changing moments for a patient? Well, I'll tell you a story. This just happened just this week. Um, patient has, you know, terrible aches and pains, you know, was told that she had arthritis and, um, you know, needed to lose weight and, and been doing that for years and years and years. Um, and we did the parathyroid surgery. And when I went to see her in the recovery room, she, before I could even say anything about how the surgery went, she said, thank you. Thank you so much. I feel so much better. That pain is all gone. And so cool. I think that that is in partly mediated by the, the, the parathyroid hormone itself, because that's what changes mm -hmm. first is the parathyroid levels. And so it's often the case that patients feel better immediately. Um, I'll tell you another story that sticks out for me is a, a, a lady that had suffered with really bad nausea and vomiting. And she had, she was diagnosed with um, gastroparesis. That just means the stomach doesn't um, empty properly into the, into the rest of the intestines. And so things go the wrong way and you end up throwing up. One of the things that the high calcium can do is mess with all the neurons and all the nerves in the stomach and the bowels that control that sort of thing. And so it's a, it's rare. That's not one of the most common symptoms, but we fixed her parathyroid disease and that went away completely. And she, she sends me a card every year on the anniversary of, of her surgery to, to thank me for that. So, so yeah, that's, that's another story that that's really stands out for me. In what you're describing to like the high calcium levels. So the calcium, uh, is being stolen to, to what should be going to the bones and it's circulating through the blood, correct? Yeah. Uh, and then you're saying that the profile of the patient is usually between 50 and 60 or older. But yep. there seems to be in that what you're saying, then naturally we get osteoporosis as we get older. If yep. then the calcium is being robbed from the bones, it seems like there'd be almost an issue with fractures or um, bone issues when they yep. land in your office. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that even if a patient is not having any of the symptoms we've been talking about, it can still lead to osteoporosis and, and fractures um, and kidney stones. Um, and so um, we recommend getting it fixed, even if 
the patient is completely asymptomatic. And so you're right, though, as as we get older, especially women that have gone through menopause, you know, their bone density is going down, um, but maybe it's going down like that. If you have parathyroid disease on top of it, it's going down like that. And so our goal is to get them back to a normal trajectory and fixing the parathyroid disease can definitely do that. Um, we know that long term, it, you know, uh, not only prevents fractures, but can prevent people progressing in their osteoporosis as well. So for those listening, and if they're feeling these symptoms that you describe, um, the main indicator is going to be a higher calcium level. Yes. Yeah, so the, the generic form of the disease is high calcium and high parathyroid hormone level. But I, I, I would encourage, you know, that you really have to check both mm -hmm. calcium and the parathyroid level together and look at that relationship. Because what can happen is um, if the calcium's high in a normal scenario, normal physiology, calcium's high, PTH should be really low. And so even if the calcium is say high normal and the PTH is kind of high, even high normal, well, that in my mind is still abnormal and they still have the disease, even if the blood work is saying, well, both numbers are in the normal range. So it's really the relationship between those two numbers. So it can be a little bit tricky. That's one of the reasons why I think it's underdiagnosed. Um, um, but um, the generic form of the disease is, as you said, high calcium, high PTH. Mm, looks like there's more questions uh, coming in, and we'll get to those. We're kind of coming to a close on this uh, episode, but your questions will be addressed uh, afterwards. So uh, please, for those of you, and thank you for attending and, and continue with your, your questions. Uh, Dr. Schneider, before we wrap things up, any kind of final thoughts you would like to leave with those viewing or listening to this interview? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say, you know, now with electronic health records, everyone has access to their blood work. So if you notice that your calcium's high and high means 10 or above, then you should ask your doctor about that. That's not normal. You should get that looked into. And if you're having symptoms and you've been through the ringer and, you know, had the thyroid worked up, you know, you've been told you have arthritis and nothing's really working and you feel like it's premature aging, you know, this is another thing that you can look into. And potentially if you have it, then we can make you feel a lot better. So, um, and, it, and it should be fixed for your long-term bone health as we've been talking about as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad to have this opportunity so that we can raise awareness about this problem. Um, if a patient feels like they are struggling and this is an issue and maybe they're checking their blood results right now as they're hearing you talk, um, if they do have a problem, where should they go to get fixed or at least looked at? Yeah, great question. So um, here at the University of Wisconsin, we we help people from all over the country. And, you know, you can email me or call our office and we're happy to, to help uh, get you in and, and get the problem resolved. I realize that, you know, Madison, Wisconsin isn't close for everybody. And so I think then that your goal is to really find an endocrine surgeon like me in your location and um, get in to see them. And, you, you know, feel free to email me. I can help, you know, direct you to the right person because there's now great endocrine surgeons all over the country and really all over the world. And, and I, I, you know, I want to help people get this problem addressed. So yeah. Great. Dr. Schneider, you can also go to the oh. Yeah, and you can also go to the AAES website. That's our professional society, the American Association mm -hmm. for Endocrine Surgeons. And there you can there's a surgeon finder where you can locate a surgeon as well. Great, Dr. Schneider. Thank you so much. Your contact info will be shared in the show notes and the great. Uh, video notes. So thank you so much for being here today. Great, great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great being with you. And for all those viewing, thank you for attending. And until next time, thank you, Dr. Schneider. Thanks. Thanks.